Hi, my name is Jim and today we're going to be discussing voltage regulators, a uh, very important part of electronics. And the purpose of a voltage regulator is to keep the output voltage constant uh, regarding changes with regard to the load or changes with the input voltage or both at the same time. So it usually connects directly to the power supply and these capacitors are very important and are usually specified to be on pin. So you don't put these on the other side of the world. They need to be very near the regulator. This is always required. The data sheets will tell you what are good values and sometimes what type of capacitor to use. And this is usually required, uh, sometimes not. So um, that's the purpose of a voltage regulator. And if we needed clean DC, so a voltage regulator has the capabilities of treating ripple is a variation in VN, and that's one of the things it's supposed to get rid of. But if we needed clean DC and we didn't want to use a regulator, we could add a section, second RC filter here, which would clean things up kind of nicely. Now the problem with that is if we have a large delta I out here having to do with a fluctuating load, is we get a delta V across this resistor, meaning that our load regulation here is terrible. So if we're, say, feeding a microphone preamplifier, which is going to be more or less a constant current rate draw, this is a fine way to clean things up. Further, you can add another section of this if you need to. And this is called a pi filter section for obvious reasons. Um, in the days of old, uh, they used to use an L in here, and this actually is a, all things being considered the same, a better regulator, but the inductor it's high cost, there's coupling issues, magnetic coupling issues that is, and the real estate for this, so in modern times um, that has fallen out of favor. So regulator issues, heat, how hot do they get? That's a concern. Uh, what's the dropout voltage, which means how low can this go before the regulator fails? Cost and real estate is how much room does this take up, say, on a circuit board? So we're going to look at these, and um, we'll start uh, by determining power, and we'll just kind of scribble up a little bit, but the load current is equal to 5 volts divided by 10 ohms, which is 500 milliamperes, half an amp, and if we wanted to find the power in this load resistor, I chose V squared over R, this is 25 over 10, or 2.5 watts. Now to find the power loss in the regulator, and this is quite significant compared to a switch mode regulator, more on that later, is all we do is take the voltage difference, keyword difference, between the output and the, the output and the input, which is going to be 10 volts. So this is going to be the voltage drop, DROP, across the regulator. And we'll just multiply that by half an amp here, and we see that the part dissipates 5 watts. So I could not touch this with my fingers, and basically it would shut itself off anyway, um, it would be that hot. And half the heat sink is connected to a large piece of metal. Further, it's got a little current here. This has some high gain amplifiers in it and so forth, and that's called I quiescent. And I'm not including that in a power calculation because it's like six or eight milliamperes, um, really quite insignificant. So at this particular point, I'm going to wander off track a little bit perhaps and talk about circuit layout with a voltage regulator because this is really a, um, a concern. The objective of the circuit layout design is to produce a stable working circuit. That's the primary purpose. Uh, other constraints are heat. Okay, If your little circuit board is sitting inside a plastic box, what are you going to do? How are you going to get rid of the heat? Let's see what else we have. Board size. You might be constrained on how large the board is. Uh, the number of crossovers. It's always nice to minimize that so you don't end up with going from top to bottom of the board through vias which are plated through holes. And uh, the number of layers too. You might end up with many layers. Uh, some computer motherboards are six, eight layers thick all laminated together. So we're going to kind of see this in action, but I need to introduce it now because I have to reset the camera and so forth. And ripple rejection ratio is kind of a big deal with a voltage regulator because it has the ability to treat ripple as delta Vn. 
and it has the ability to suppress that ripple. And the question is, well, how good does that work? So on a data sheet, this will either be specified by RRR for ripple rejection ratio or RR for ripple rejection. And uh, you need to you know, look at the data sheet to figure that out. And you know, data sheets are very, very important. So if we have a regulator, and this is my attempt to show some ripple coming in, the question is, is you know, what's, what's the ripple coming out? So what we're going to do is take the worst case for a 7805 regulator. The worst case ripple rejection ratio is specified as 62 decimals. That means that any part greater than 62 will produce less ripple on the output, less being good. Now, the word ripple rejection or ripple rejection ratio means important that it's a negative value. If this were to be plus 62, the output ripple would be hundreds of times larger than the ripple, the input ripple, and that doesn't make sense. So you have to remember when you go to solve the equation that this is negative 62. So we have negative 62 dB equals 20 times the log of V out over V in, where these are the respective ripple ratios. So I can obviously solve for either one of these if I know this, but right now all I want to do is find out what the ratio is, how good this part is, using a number that I can kind of understand. So to start with, I need to isolate the log operator, and I'll do that by dividing both sides by 20, and that gives me negative 3.1 equals the log of the ratio, and then taking the inverse log of both sides, a lot of writing there, doesn't really mean anything, well it does, but what it comes down to is this, uh, the inverse log of this guy, negative 3.1, is 10, raised to the negative 3.1 power and this is equal to x okay that's all it is on your calculators you have about 10 to the x well the x is negative 3.1 and if we solve for x we find out that it comes out to be about 794e to the negative 6 which doesn't mean a whole lot to me so what i'm going to do is take the reciprocal of it and i end up with a number of 1259 that means that the output ripple is 1,259 times lower than the input ripple. So that's really suppressing it good, and this is a worst case value. Um, when we lay out, and we'll, we'll do this here in a minute, a circuit board with a regulator, we have to be careful, uh, and this here is going to be our ground bus, of how we do that. Now when you do layouts, you import your schematic into a circuit layout program and it comes in with everything connected together properly in a rat's nest. And then you drag things to where you want. And this is a terrible layout. This really needs to be short and this ground really needs to go directly here. So in this configuration, if you were to do it this way, not only is the regulator likely to, to um, oscillate, is that with a little bit of bad luck, there'll be a, a submultiple of the wavelength here, and this will be called an antenna. So this will radiate all over the place. So you have to be very careful in layout that you pay attention to what the data sheet tells you to do with regard to things like this. Remember, a circuit trace is made up of series L and series R distributed. It's not a short circuit. The traces aren't very good conductors. Figuratively speaking, we have to be careful. Okay, so standing on one leg guy here, and let's um, let's move over to the computer and look at some stuff. And let's see here. Tip this down a little bit. Yeah, it's looking good. And maybe refocus that. Okay. And let's look at a data sheet first. So um, I'll pull this guy up. Now this is uh, this is from DigiKey, um, and they're they're very good at having data sheets that are very easy to find. So what we're seeing here is this is the LM78XX family. And what the XX means is that there are several different 
uh, models in this family that have different voltages. We have five going up to 24 volts. So it's a very popular family. And down here you see the pinout, and this is shown in a TO220 um, package. And it's got a metal tab on the back that you can screw to a heat sink, and then you'd put a heat sink compound on that, which would reduce the thermal resistance. So uh, this is all the stuff about it. Let's see what it says. Current up to 1 ampere, that's nice. Thermal overload protection. So if this guy overheats, it shuts himself off. Short circuit protection. So if we short the output, it won't blow up the part. Uh, output transistor safe area is these two things combined. So if we move on down here a little bit and take a look at the block diagram on this, is uh, what we can see is that we have a series pass element and the output of this say would be 5 volts and the input for our other example would be 15. So there's going to be 10 volts across this transistor or series of transistors and here we have an air amplifier that's kind of like an operational amplifier and there's a reference voltage here and that's like setting the speed control uh, for cruise control rather on your car and it's sampling the output and feeding it back into this amplifier and the difference is driving the series pass element. What this little variable resistor is about is for different uh, voltage regulators, the manufacturer changes that value and that's how they get the different, um, the different output voltages. So we see we have thermal protection built in um, and the safe area protection, keeping an eye on our series pass elements which are the transistors which are really going to get warm. Moving down a little bit is uh, what we see let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Is that the input voltage uh, maximum for the one we're using here is going to be 35 volts. Now that's not a suggestion. That means 35.0 volts don't go above it. So if we take a look at this, your output voltage, and this is overall, and we'll be looking down here, where the load can change from 5 mils to 1 amp here. Um, and the input voltage can change from 7 volts to 20 volts. So under that drastically large change, I guess can't make it bigger, uh, the output will be typically 5 volts. Minimum is 4.75 and maximum is 5.25. So any part that's considered good would um, fall in that range. Now, uh, moving on down a little bit, if we look at line regulation, which is just how well it's going to work with changes in line voltages, going from 7 to 25, typical, it's going to change 4 millivolts. The maximum output voltage change will be 100 millivolts. So this is our part of our ability to suppress ripple rejection has to do with this right here. Likewise, we have uh, regulation with regard to the load. If we change the load from 5 milliamperes up to 1.5 milliamperes, the typical output voltage change in millivolts is 9, in the worst case is going to be 100 uh, millivolts. So uh, what we would be designing for, or taking into account, is the worst case output. And that's going to be the largest one in this particular example. Now here's where we get into ripple rejection ratio and what we see here is that F is equal to 120 Hertz so what that tells us immediately is that we're working with a bridge rectifier and we see this, the typical uh, ripple rejection ratio is 73 decibels and the worst case is going to be 62 and that's what we used previously in our, um, our little example. First we have the dropout voltage. Now look at this. This is a this is a bad spec. It's expected 2 volts typical. So dropout voltage means that how low can the input voltage go before the output voltage begins to change? When, when does the regulator begin to fail? And all they're telling us here is that the typical is 2 volts. Well how do I divide, to design around the worst case if I have a typical? So I really need to have the maximum on this to come up with a safe design. So I'm not at all pleased with this in the data sheet, and this is an older part, and that's one of the reasons why I'm using it for an example. Now let me go down here to page 19. Notice how I memorize that. And they have some interesting things here. 18, 19. So this is going to be our circuit. 
um, input and output to the CN is shown as a, uh, a 330 uh, nanofarad capacitor and the output is a 100 nanofarad and uh, let's see what it says about this this is pretty straightforward or so it seems C in is required if the regulator is located an appreciable distance from the power supply filter meaning capacitor what is an appreciable distance what how many ounces of copper is the circuit board made of is it a half ounce per square foot or four ounces per square foot how thick is the trace this means absolutely nothing CO improves stability this is capacitor output and transient response so up here if we had a fast changing load CO would help discharge and, and fill in the blank what they don't tell you is that the maximum output capacitance for this regulator is 100 nanofarad. Now I found out this very hard way when I put a 47 there and it's not specified that I can't and found a little bit of a sawtooth riding on top of 5 volts. So this data sheet here is older and um, it's you know really not I think all that good. The newer parts like the LM2940 have an unlimited size for the output capacitors. It's always going to be stable. So having said that, uh, let's take a look at multi-SIM here. And uh, this is our circuit. And uh, the reason I've got a 220 microfarad as the input filter cap or capacitor for the regulator and a 0.1 ohm resistor and I have to have this or I get a sim error and the reason is is because this will produce a starting and transient current which mathematically will approach infinity so I have to limit it a little bit and uh, what we see here in this case is a 100 ohm output and a 100 nanofarad output capacitor and uh, if we were to simulate this is this is what we end up seeing and let me turn off the um, the grid here it's a little bit distracting is notice that uh, down here in the corner here we're seeing zero volts and then our output here is five volts and then this is our input voltage and that is made from need to kind of tell you that uh, superimposing uh, DC a DC voltage seven volts DC on top of in this case a 60 Hertz 90% duty cycle triangular waveform which is sometimes called a sawtooth so that's what's coming in um, is this guy right here in red and you have to do kind of admit that this does look like ripple voltage now the thing that we really really need to be careful of is this these dimples and I really hope you can see these well this is the point where the input voltage it's so low is that the regulator fails and the output starts to follow the input anytime you look at a power supply and that's always a good place to start after you know seeing if anything's burnt or so on is if you see anything like this is that there's a problem you know don't don't go any further stop and this could be caused by the uh, filter capacitor losing capacity it could be caused by the load resistor drawing too much current and it could be caused by a low VN voltage like maybe uh, we're in a bit of a brownout 105 volts on the line and um, this is the way that would look so if we want to find out what this dropout voltage actually is let me turn on the cursors here oh uh, where they at here they are and I'll drag this over right to this edge oops and um, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll read this I can't make this any bigger but uh, what this is saying is the input voltage that's this guy here in red where this intersecting the cursor is 6.7 volts and the output right there before the dimple is 5.00 volts so if this goes any lower than 6.7 volts then the output will drop so this is in fact a dropout voltage and what we could say is that is 1.7 volts higher than the actual output voltage but that has to be specified and you always want to stay away from the lowest possible values because caps do wear out they're a common failure uh, mechanism 
So uh, after having do that, let us do this. We'll do a transfer here uh, to Alderboard real quick. Uh, I'll say yes to that and say OK to that. And let's make this a whole lot bigger so we can see it. Let me zero in on him and make him bigger. Okay, so here we are. There's our parts uh, connected by a rat's nest. And it's up to us to lay it out. Now, all the board doesn't know anything about how close the capacitors have to be. So I'll select this part, drag it here, and then I'll select C1 or CN. And I'll put him over here. And then here's our load resistor. Put over here, and here's C2, and I will put him over here next to the load resistor. This is a terrible design. Bad. C1 needs to be very, very close to the regulator. Very close. And C2, likewise, needs to be very close with a nice heavy ground connecting pin 2 to the appropriate lead on these capacitors. So when you lay out a circuit board, even though it simulates perfectly, if you don't pay attention to these sorts of things, it's not going to work at all. So that'll uh, conclude what we have to say about or what I have to say about uh, voltage regulators. And uh, thank you for watching.